Good morning. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm here to tell you one of those stories. Now, this morning, you've been to the moon and the New York subway. I'm not sure how those two are going to relate at the end of the day. And you've learned about teaching people genetics. But I am defective. I am a carrier of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So before I tell you how, what happened to my family, let me introduce you to my family. This was long ago. I was a young bride. I married a physician. So my parents, who were from Germany, and his parents, who were from Italy, said, life is perfect. You marry a doc, never a problem. <laughs> never. He was also a football player for Notre Dame. He played, with Air, Air, he played under scholarship for Air Parsegian, and he was a defensive end. So not only was he a doctor, he was a big strapping guy, and we would have football player children. So that was in the mix. We had plans and dreams, and we knew that life was going to be easy and almost perfect, right? Why shouldn't it be? So we had four lovely children. We were from a small town called Middletown, Ohio. We chose that town because it was a single hospital. He was going to be home for lunch. We would have this family, and we would all grow up together. Except here's was what wasn't known in that marriage, is that I was a carrier of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We didn't know it. We didn't know it then. So when I think about my parents and his parents, they all smoked. My father also owned a company that made doctor bags, the kind you see on Westerns where they open up and they have those two compartments. And every single Sunday of my life, when I was a little girl, I would go to the factory with my dad because I could play in his roll top desk and I could play with a dumb waiter and I could just mess around in the factory. And he would light the glue pots. And at a certain moment, the glue pots would be hot enough for Monday when the workers got there to adhere the leather onto the wood frame of those doctor bags. And he would smell, I think we're ready to go. And we would. But what I learned it, when I knew I was a carrier, I learned that probably something happened in conception. So it must have been their fault, right? My father smoking that glue pot, my, Tom's parents who smoked, something happened. And, and I was learned that one in 10,000 egg and sperm carry this mutation as a new event. Now, I don't know who of you collects and carries and counts eggs and sperm, but I didn't know about those statistics and I don't still know if they're true. So these are my two little boys, and on a day in June, they were diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You might say, did you see any symptoms? Of course I did. These boys were big. They were going to have big muscles. They were going to run down Notre Dame's football field like their father. But I complained and said, listen, I, I think they're weak. I, they don't do stairs very well. They really like to color more than like, they like to jump on the couch. And then my mother said, you have a very organized household, and you are the best mother with the most well-balanced and well-behaved children. Your neighbors have real renegades, boys that ran up and down stairs, and they were shooting each other with little toy guns, but mine were coloring, so that was good. They were well-behaved. But actually, when they were diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, all of that well-behaved went out the window, and I know that they were weak, and that confirmed my suspicions that I had for a very long time. So I went down to the doctor at Cincinnati Children's because Chris had injured his ankle. And what I think he did is tore his Achilles tendon. And when I went down to the doctor, the doctor said to me, these boys have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I said, I'm a nurse, but I'm not in pediatrics because I don't like sick children. Um, and I don't want this disease, so let's just fix it. And he said, you can't. These children don't have a structural protein in their muscle, and their muscles are going to fall apart. So they're walking now, but by the time they're 9, 10, 11, they're not going to walk. And by the time they're 15 or 14 or even earlier, they won't move their arms. They won't be able to lift their arm to their mouth to feed themselves, and they'll be dead as teenagers. Do you have any questions, he asked me. <laughs> and then he said, you should have known you're a carrier. You could have aborted them. So that day was one of my first really aggressive approaches. I grabbed this person by the tie. I put him up to my face and said, if anybody gets aborted or shot today, you are going to be the person. These children are not. 
So what can we do? I ask, where are the standard of care? I'm in nursing. I was in renal dialysis, oral organ transplantation. I was in the, in the flu epidemic at the Ohio State University and took care of that intensive care unit. What is the standard of care? He said, there isn't one. So I said, my children are flat footed. If you put arches under their feet, will they accommodate? Will that help them? Will they walk five minutes longer? He said, who cares? They're going off their feet. I said, because five minutes is meaningful. A month is even more meaningful. So we didn't use arches. So when you're a carrier and you're defective, even though you say intellectually that's not true and everyone has these genetic mutations, you feel defective. You feel like as a wife, you have failed this man. You have married him with this unknown, which is a pretty big unknown. You failed as a woman. How and why did this happen to you, right? How could it? You want to blame someone. I wanted to point to my parents and say to my mother, it's your fault. You're a carrier. She wasn't. Just me. I have three healthy brothers and they have healthy children. Just me. And as a mother, you did this to your children. And you can say intellectually you didn't, but you did. Physiologically, you delivered this gene. You are a carrier that would take your children's lives. And from my children, who did this to me? And my daughters, are we at risk? Yes, you are. And then I said, well, so we'll just fix it, right? Because is, is medicine good enough to fix it? And my son said, do we need fixing? Or do you need fixing? Somebody needed fixing. So what did I do? Well, you know, Physicians, including my husband, thought they were on a pedestal and they think medicine is all rocket science. And so I was a neurotic, crazy, desperate mother. I was. I was also smart enough in medicine to know that they put their socks on those docks exactly the way I did. But I knew I'm going to have to get in their offices and in the major labs to understand what are we going to do here? What is the plan? What can we do? So I ordered, because this was before the internet, I had to order all the articles. I circled all of those names of those PIs. And I also went to the bank and borrowed $100,000 on my signature, on my husband's signature. And when I came home that night and talked to him about what I did, my middle name became Damn It. Pat, damn it, what are you thinking, right? And to get a drug developed takes years and years and years and a billion dollars. And I said, he wouldn't give me a billion dollars at the bank, just 100,000. He said, give it back. And I said, no. And then I went into major labs and I said, I'm a postdoc looking for a job because I didn't want to be a neurotic, desperate mom. And I wanted the real truth. What is wrong here? And what could we do about it? And what do you need to get this done? And I also went to see physicians because I was a physician in that case and asked them, what is it going to be the standard of care here? Because I have two patients with Duchenne. Well, it turned out there wasn't a standard of care. There wasn't much investment. People weren't working together. So what then? So I started this nonprofit called Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, and I decided we would fix it. I first couldn't get these people to talk together. So on the front of Time Magazine, you'll remember Michael Blaze and French Anderson did that first gene therapy experiment. So I said, Michael Blaze and French Anderson are coming to a meeting. Will you come? And they did. And so did French Anderson. And he said, I'm going to cure this in 18 months, which started this big argument. You can't do it. You can't do it. There's the reasons you can't. People aren't working together. The same things I'd heard. No standard of care, no money, no nothing. But that was a business plan for me. So I started Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy with that business plan. Standard of care, centers of excellence, and a research plan. And we started our first center of excellence at the University of Pittsburgh with Eric Hoffman, who was credited for identifying the protein product in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we gave him and signed a contract that says, we'll give you $300,000 a year for five years running. And his center was focused on cell and gene therapy. Then we went out to UCLA and did a second one. And that center was focused on the role of inflammation in this disease. Because as muscle cell degenerates, you know better than I, there's a big inflammatory component. But that wasn't enough because parents, money, while good, is not terrifically credible in their view. Nor is it sustainable. And we had a disease. What you need is characterize. 
For heaven's sake, this is a complicated multi-system disease. And we still don't know if these hearts are built to last. So we had to do something different. So I felt like I had lived about 20 lives by now, but I think I'm counting this as my six lives, having had little deaths along the way, a diagnosis of my son's the feeling that I wasn't, couldn't have value in my family, disappointing my husband, disappointing my sons, disappointing my daughters, disappointing my big German family who told me I was from good stock, but apparently not, just them. So I thought there should be a law. So I went up to, to the NIH. They weren't terribly interested in investing. So then I went to Congress and made some friends along the way. And I wrote a piece of legislation called the Muscular Dystrophy Care Act, Centers of Excellence, Standard of Care, and a Research Plan. So this particular bill was introduced into the House and Senate on Valentine's Day of 2001. My sons had been gone by that time. They died at 15 and 17, seven months to the day apart. I think Chris died and Patrick saw the writing on the wall and gave up. So this bill was especially important to me to get done. Congress took on the lead on this, the late Senator Wellstone, Senator Specter. House member Roger Wicker, and they pulled this through and signed it into law in December of 2001. And from that day until this day, there's a $500 million investment by the Department of Defense, the National Institutes of Health, and the Center for Disease Control that continues to grow. We were able to get it reauthorized in 2008 and again in 14 and put in 14, put a provision in it that says it will never sundown so that the NIH three different institutes, NIH, NIAMS, NINDS, and, NI and HLBI, have to invest in muscular dystrophy. Have to. It's a law. So then, as companies came, because of that tipping point, that NIH investment, companies came and there was interest and there was awareness about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Then you have to say to yourself, okay, if those companies get to a point and they're looking at this trajectory in these kids and they're trying to measure something that takes 20 years to die because now the mean age of death for Duchenne muscular dystrophy is about 28 years old. So it's a death sentence of 20 years diagnosis is mean age of four to five. So after that diagnosis, you have 20 years of, of decline. So what do you measure? How do you measure it? And how's the FDA going to judge that? So we went up to the FDA and we said, you need to know what living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy feels like. And they said, kind of this, we can't have 20 women crying in a corner. And I said to them, no, you can't, but you could quantify the tears so that you understand the burden of the illness on this particular population. And we will do a preference study for you so we can convince you of what that is and what those risks those parents will take for the gain that they would expect in these children. And so we wrote the first preference study and we got a policy forum and had the FDA there to listen. So we were the first. And that led to more preference studies because we wanted them to know what risk for what gain, how much we would take on. We also asked them because by this time companies are coming into the space and they're working really hard about trying to develop not only uh, possibilities to, to replace dystrophin, to express dystrophin, to substitute for dystrophin. So they're working on all these strategies as well as the downstream. So we said to the FDA, write a playbook, right? Give them some tools, write this playbook, write some guidance on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the FDA said, no, we don't write guidance on rare diseases. And then Janet Woodcock said to me, you write it. I said, okay. Then I walked away saying, how do you write guidance for the FDA? So we created a steering committee and a group, and in six months, we produced the first guidance for Duchenne muscular dystrophy to the FDA. We wanted to set a stage for a playbook. And within one year, they turned around and wrote guidance on Duchenne muscular dystrophy and released it. So we were able to turn that ship of the FDA into really thinking through what is it like to live with Duchenne, providing tools to companies. What is it that they could do to help? So this is our current pipeline. We have more than 40 companies in the space working not only on dystrophin and its expression, but working on all the downstream. And we believe that combination therapies are the only way forward here. They're the only way. Because if you think about it now, some of the outcome measures are really limited to an ambulatory population. And they start at seven, six, seven years old. So if you're below six or if you're not ambulatory, 
you're not included. You're outside the bus. And you might be outside of the bus for that lifetime that you have, which is short already. So we have to think differently now about these trials. We have to work on this because one at a time, building a house and taking it down and building a house and taking it down isn't going to get to what we all believe combination therapies have to be for these children to stop the disease. We also were instrumental in accelerating gene therapy. We knew that there were several companies involved in, in really moving gene therapy forward, but nothing's ever fast enough for us. So we went and asked a, an investigator if we could do an investigator-initiated protocol, if we could give them some money to start the first gene therapy experiment. We were able to do that, giving Jerry Mandel at the Ohio State University or, or Nationwide Children's $2.2 million to start the first couple of patients in gene therapy. We felt like we were there, almost like landing on the moon. A gene therapy, the replacement with a microdystrophin, that big, long dystrophin gene. Would it work? Could it help? How long will it help? What do we need to learn from this? So that was started, and we feel like we're getting there. Little by little by little, we're getting there. We worry, too, about access and reimbursement. We're already thinking approval and access and reimbursement for all of these things. We're also thinking about how can we improve the diagnosis of these kids? How can we get them younger and younger and younger? Because I think we know that treating patients earlier is better in terms of successful outcomes. Later, later treating is important, but we might not see or be able to measure successfully the outcomes. So we'll launch newborn screening soon in New York State using the SMA1 infrastructure. We feel that that's important. And we're also going to look for carriers so that carriers like me will know that and go into a marriage or a partnership knowing the unknown and be able to make decisions about what happens next. So these are the final thoughts about being a defective carrier. It's hard. You internalize this all of your life. You play if then, if I did this, then I did, didn't do that, or if I was good in pregnancy or didn't drink in pregnancy or didn't smoke in pregnancy or didn't even do something in pregnancy, would I have been different? Would the outcome have been different? We know it wouldn't in my case. But don't be thinking about my story. Think about your own. Our next step will do a platform study in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We will and we can revolutionize how we treat rare diseases. Children do not deserve to be sick. They don't deserve to see a doc who says no hope and no help. They don't deserve the burden on their families that causes families to fall apart or husbands to say with every single sentence, Pat, damn it, what are you doing again? We all deserve to be a little disruptive. We will in our lives have to reinvent ourselves 10, 20, 50 times and we'll keep doing it. We all have genetic mutations but some of them are defective, and that's me. At the end of the day, we have to take leaps. We have to take heart, and we have to find places where we can take power back. And so for me, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, creating this opportunity with all of the people, and then there are zillions of them that helped along the way, we can and we will do it. And by that time, it's my get-even strategy. Thank you create your own legacy. <laughs>